Uh, so we are uh, called Wicked Connections and Wicked is actually an acronym that stands for Wish You Knew Education Connections. I'm not sure about all of you, but when I joined SHU, like I learned so much in the first day that I wish I knew back in grade 11 and 12, maybe even back in grade nine. Uh, and that's when we realized that the only way for us to accelerate our learning path is to have mentors. People with mentors, they learn a lot faster. They make better and more informed decisions. And that leads to a, a more prosperous education and ultimately career. So uh, we are really excited to work with SPP to talk about networking. I know it's a, it's a huge thing uh, in Shulik. Like it's, it's very uh, daunting sometimes. People always talk about, I guess, previously in-person networking circles. I don't even know what online networking circles, breakout rooms could be like, probably even more intimidating. And uh, so I think there's a lot that we can do here uh, and help demystify, you know, it, it's not too scary. There are some steps that we can take to make this process a little bit more simple, a little less intimidating, and it can be very, very helpful uh, in learning what you want to do. And then once you figure that out, then uh, trying to pursue that path. So, uh, so I gave myself already a quick introduction. I'd like to also now bring Zareen to the stage to introduce herself as our co-founder as well. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Zareen Tasnim. I went to Schulich as well along with Carol. I graduated last year. Um, actually, that's not last year, it's 2019. Wow, it's been almost a year and a half. I guess I lost track of time, but uh, I'm actually an international student from Bangladesh. So currently I'm working at Procter & Gamble uh, in their operations team. Um, so yeah, super excited to be here today and hosting this program with SPP. I was part of SPP as well in my first and second year, especially being an international students. So I definitely found the group very, very valuable to make connections that I still have to this day. So super excited. Awesome. And I know uh, Zareen is also bringing a special expertise here as she was an international student. And we know that, you know, there are some, maybe some differences on the important perceptual importance of networking or even the approach to it, how one country networks versus another. So Zareen will be a great uh, voice here if she feels as though there's anything in particular she had to learn more and or if in the breakout room you had any international specific questions, Zareen is an awesome person to chat with. Okay, and now I'm, I'm very, very excited to be welcoming our panelist. So we have here, uh, first and foremost, I'd like to introduce Iman. So Iman is um, a friend of mine and she went to Queens uh, Smith uh, School of Business and she studied marketing. She was very, very active in marketing. Uh, I'm not sure if, if any of you have been in marketing. She was in the QMAC, uh, a QMA that hosts the QMAC competition and conference, which was really great. Uh, and not only did I want her here because she has that experience from a marketing and Queens perspective, I thought Iman's journey was super impressive because she networked her way all the way across a different continent and found a great job in London. So Iman, if you could uh, quickly introduce yourself. Yeah, for sure. Uh, thanks so much, Carol, for that introduction. Uh, yes, yeah, so in the same age as Carol, I went to Queens was super involved in the QMA for any one of you who might have had the chance to go to the conferences, of course, pre-COVID. Um, yeah, started off my career at General Mills, so pretty traditional CPG path, and then decided to take my career in a different direction and break into tech. And through a combination of LinkedIn networking and cold calls and reach out, I now found myself in London where I'm working for a tech company over there. So hopefully that will help. Yeah, and really looking forward to digging into that, Iman. I'm sure a lot of ears perked up when they heard that you're able to go uh, to such a great city to work in. Next up, we have Sasha, who is a York Schulich alumni. And right now he is a consultant, but previously he actually was also in finance. So I think uh, his story would be really interesting because uh, to know, you know, did his networking techniques evolve and or uh, how was it so strong in both industries? So Sasha, uh, please take some time to introduce yourself. Hey guys. Uh, so yeah, my name is Sasha. I am a 2018 grad uh, from Shulik. Um, so I, as Carol mentioned, uh, did investment banking during my summer uh, with RBC. So after my third year, I uh, did an investment banking internship at RBC. Um, and then since then, I've been doing consulting at Kearney, which is like a mid-sized uh, management consulting firm. Uh, so I work mostly in Canada, but also in the US uh, through them. Uh, in terms of specialties, I work mostly in financial institutions and like CPGs, so like consumer retail. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll leave the, the rest for, for later in questions or, or during other answers. 
Awesome. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Sasha. And last but certainly not least, we have Yan Yan. Uh, so Yan Yan, I actually met through um, a coworker at Accenture while Yan Yan is still a student. Uh, she studies both psychology and business at Western. And the reason why I wanted to bring Yan Yan here, not only because of her diverse experience uh, studying multiple different uh, specialties, but Yan Yan was actually one of the best coffee chats I ever had uh, with a student. And I've chatted with Yan Yan now, I think maybe three times in, in a, the last couple months. Um, and the relationship Yang and I formed was purely online. And I know, you know, the chain networking online is a different ball game entirely. So I thought Yang Yan could bring really great uh, recent and expert opinion on this subject matter. So Yang Yan, please introduce yourself. Yeah, hi guys. Uh, thank you, Carol, for the great introduction. I mean, I'm really honored to be invited by you. I mean, we be, like I basically networked my way here today. But um, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, uh, definitely, my experiences are still quite limited as I'm still a student, but I am in my fourth year of university and uh, going to uh, try VZ out uh, this summer at uh, Round 13 Capital and really happy to talk about my experiences with everyone. Yan Yan is super humble. Uh, she has a lot to share, trust me, uh, and you'll, you'll see very shortly. So now I'm going to stop sharing screen so that we can focus on uh, the beautiful faces of our panelists. So to kick it off, we want to start on a little bit of a light note, you know, even though the three of you are all professional networks at this point, we wanted to maybe start with a funny story, maybe a networking oopsies you made back in the day. I can volunteer uh, my first, I call it networking fail. Um, this was one of the first companies I ever recruited with, and I wasn't actually trying to recruit with them at first. I was just doing a case competition and having a lot of fun. So then I just naturally uh, started to go through the interview process. And when we reached the final round, um, I was talking to one of uh, a more uh, senior member of the firm, and he offered to give me some time if I if I made my way over to the company and he would prepare me. And I felt I actually felt guilty. I was like, oh, no, I'm not worth his time. Like, you know, all the help he's given me so far has already been more than uh, worthwhile. So I actually turned him down uh, feeling guilty. And after that, failed the interview, kicked myself in the butt. I now realize that not only should I not feel guilty for asking for people's time because it prepares me better, but also a lot of people when they reach the firm, they take it on as an extracurricular to do recruiting and help students out. So oftentimes it's a passion and it's something that, um, that actually does help their career when they have success in this area. So I realized after all, maybe I shouldn't have you know, been overthinking things, uh, feeling so guilty and just uh, not only say yes, but actually in the future ask for for people's time. So that was my little faux pas right there. Uh, Yan Yan, uh, any stories from you? Maybe a virtual story or just a general networking story? Yeah, sure. So my story comes, I think, was in my first year. I was actually trying to network with an upper year student, uh, just wanting to understand like how their summer went and like what they did to like recruit for the firm. But um, Generally, I just want to say that my memory is quite good, but for some reason, names just go out the window for me. So when I first saw her, I was like, oh, hi, but, but suddenly, like, I just forgot her name on the spot. Um, and she was like, oh, you're Yan Yan, right? And generally, you would say like, oh, yeah, and you are like X, but I just couldn't say that because I forgot her name. And so um, generally in... Uh, coffee chats, I would just have a notebook out and like write notes down. But in this case, I was like, Oh, can I use my phone to write to write some notes? And she's like, Oh, yeah, perfect. Like, that's totally fine. So instead of writing notes, I actually looked up her name instead, and actually continued the conversation afterwards. Um, and I guess like also shows that you should be flexible and adaptive when you're in coffee chats. Yeah, and yeah, that's hilarious. I have forgotten people's names for sure, but I've never had such a smooth recovery. So I'm very impressed by you. Sasha, how about you? Any smooth or not so smooth mistakes in recovery? Yeah, so actually, well, one is I just like, just like a, a dumb mistake, but I misspelled my own name. And then like when I showed up to the coffee, that was like the first thing they brought up. They're like, oh, by the way, like it's usually customary to like spell your name correctly, um, which was kind of awkward, but and then uh, the second one, actually, Yan Yan, I had a very similar experience, but mine was slightly worse, I think, uh, because I'm, I don't have a very good memory. So I actually showed up 
um i showed up at a so i had like three coffees in like one day because so I, I don't live downtown so then when i had this was back when it wasn't virtual so when i had coffees i would schedule like three of them in one day so then i would make the trip downtown I, i'd meet a couple of people back to back anyways you know people start looking the same and uh and yeah, I just, I would like, I just called them by the wrong name, by like someone like that they work with. So it was like, so it was like, it was like two people at TD. So this was back when I was recruiting for uh, investment banking. And I like talked with, I had two scheduled like back to back. So I just like referred to him as his like, like coworker's name. Um, so it's kind of awkward, but yeah, those are, those are my two. Well, Sasha, let's hope that at least that coworker has a positive association with their coworker and was happy with the, the name swap there. I'll, I'll cross my fingers for you. Uh, last but not least, Iman. Um, yeah, so I don't think I have like a, a fail, but um, I, I do have one that really didn't go as planned and I probably messed it up a couple of times along the way. So I don't know if it, about you guys, but I, I LinkedIn stock a lot. And, and sometimes you see someone on LinkedIn and you're like, oh my gosh, this person is my idol. Like I need to be like them. But I thought I found my idol on LinkedIn. Uh, she was like the director of loyalty or marketing at Indigo, the big Canadian retailer. And she had just moved positions on LinkedIn to Lululemon to now lead loyalty at Lululemon. So I immediately swooped in, slid into her LinkedIn DMs. And I was like, hey, like you're awesome. I didn't say that, but um, I was like, I, I would love to learn more about your career path. And like, you've just transitioned to Lululemon. This is my dream company. Send her that message. And her response, it wasn't, it wasn't like she just missed me entirely, but she was like, hey, like, thanks so much. It's just like, my life is really hectic right now because I'm moving across the country. Like I have to move my kids and family over out West. And to me, I was like, oh, shucks. Like I should have had just a little bit more empathy for how busy she was right now, that this is not really the best time for her to be giving chat. So that was like mistake number one. And then she actually gave me a window and she's like, look, I'm really swamped right now, but why don't you follow up with me in September when I'm a little bit more settled and I'd be happy to have a chat. And then I guess like things just caught up with me and I never followed up. And to this day, like when I see her profile, I'm like, I had the opportunity and I just didn't plan it out properly and execute on it. So some lessons learned from that one for sure. All right. Well, Iman, just to clarify, did you regret reaching out in the first place or was it like, oh, you wish you maybe thought about something and maybe reach out a different time? I think the timing could have been better the first time, but um, I think the second mistake was just not following up on that opportunity. Okay. Like yeah. you just need to be grabby with these things. So right. yeah, that was my mistake. Right, right. I think it's a uh, follow similar vein of mine. You gotta, you gotta just go for it and be confident. So uh, thanks for the story pa stories, panelists. Um, so now we want to start getting into the meat of the discussion and uh, try to give our students something that they can take away with. So the, the first thing we want to cover, maybe starting with Iman and Sasha, because you guys have made the full transition networking within school and now uh, into full-time careers. Uh, we, I wanted to ask you guys, why we should be networking. Everyone knows that networking, of course, leads to referrals. So that one is very clear. Are there any other major benefits of networking uh, that you think maybe are overlooked uh, in, for first and second year students? Uh, maybe we can start with Sasha. Yeah, sure. So I think, I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that um, you need like a good resume and like that. And once you have a good resume, you're good. So like you have good grades or whatever, and you're all good. Um, I know. So <laughs> anyways, there's this like triangle principle um, that I used to be a big advocate of when I was in school. Um, so I used to be on YFC, um, if that's still around, I think it is. But um, so I, I was an exec there and we had the triangle pr the principle. Right. And the principle was basically grades, extracurriculars and networking um, and grades and extracurriculars alone, like both together can make up for networking. But networking alone can make up for the other two, uh, in some ways, obviously. Um, so I think the, the biggest misconception is that it's a optional thing. Um, I think you can get jobs without networking, but I think it's like, at that point, it's just kind of like a lottery. Um, so I know at my firm, for example, so I'm the only person um, that's ever been hired there from Shulik. Um, and the reason is, is because I network. Um, I think if you go in with just like your resume, most of the time they won't, uh, they just won't even look at it because they've already met people. So like you have to think about it this way, right? If a company is hiring 10 people, likely there are 10 people who took the time to network 
And so they're going to be on the top of the list. And then once the resumes are screened, they're going to have preferential treatment. And so you have to like, your resume have to, has to be so much better for them to take a shot on you. Whereas it's much safer to go with someone they've already met. Um, so I wouldn't think of it as like a, a secondary thing or as like an optional thing. I would think of it as like the primary thing to get a job. And then the other things are what enables networking to be successful. So it's like network and then make sure you have good grades and experience so that once that networking translates into like a resume screening or an interview, you have good quality stuff to then back up uh, the networking that you did. So. Okay. And then one, one clarification question is, would you say this is a principle within finance only, finance and consulting or all industries? What is your opinion? Uh, so I only work in like professional services. So I know like consulting, banking, a little bit of accounting just from my friends. Um, I'd say for those, it's, it's basically, that's like the, the, the way to think about it. Um, I don't know for industry. So for industry, maybe it's different just because they have like so many people applying that they'll just look at the best resume. Um, but likely I would imagine it applies to industry as well. But for pre anything professional services, it for sure applies. Okay, okay. So Iman, you are, uh, you did have, experience, of course, experience in industry and in marketing. Uh, what is your opinion? Is it different or did you want to talk about something, another aspect of networking entirely? Yeah, I mean, I feel like the most obvious benefit of networking is that you kind of expand your own presence across your network. Of course, there's the benefit of it ultimately turning into a referral or someone putting in a good word for you at a company. I think the other way you can look at networking is that it's one of the best ways to genuinely learn about different streams. You know, it's so common as students to be obsessed with information overload and researching tons of different career options, but you can get so much more out of your time if you put that time towards coffee chats and talking to people who are actually in those professions versus researching and spending time behind a laptop. So just when you're thinking about your career and what types of streams you're interested in, you will get so much more out of those real conversations than just online research. Yeah, absolutely. I, I completely agree with Iman, especially in the elements of one, a lot of online research might not be Canadian based. So when you talk about culture or anything else, uh, if you get an Amer American response could be very different than a can Canadian response. And also there's a lot of things, um, the simple way I put it is if you don't network, who are you listening to? Where are you getting your information? It's company reps uh, and maybe online. So company reps, they are of course biased. They are selling you their company. So they won't tell you the 100% picture. They'll tell you a, a true picture, but it's definitely one-sided. And online research, you know, it depends. Maybe you hit the jackpot, but what if you're going for a company less popular, et cetera? So it, and I, so I completely agree with these speakers. Like it's, it's very critical. It shouldn't be thought of as an extracurricular and optional. It should be considered one of the areas within a rubric in, in which you could be marked. And I just want to quickly ask Serene, if you had any uh, thing you want to add from an international perspective that you see commonly overlooked, or do you feel like these are uh, pretty applicable as well? No, I think most of the ground is really covered. I feel like when I came in, uh, because I guess back home in Bangladesh specifically, you know, grades are really what's um, most important. Like nobody really talks about extracurriculars very much. So for me, the really the challenge was kind of figuring out that extracurriculars was really important for me to kind of stand out, uh, especially among my peers. And you know, I, I kind of figured it out a little bit too late, in my opinion. But thankfully, I was able to bounce back. But I think uh, like now, my my sister is actually attending university, and I'm kind of coaching her in that regard, that extracurriculars is just as important as your grades, which I think, you know, because of my culture and, you know, kind of the mindset that we have in our community and in our country that is often overlooked. So I feel like that was kind of a big thing for me, in my opinion, when it came to networking. Right. And Zareen, when you bring in extracurriculars, you mean it's because extra, extracurriculars connect you with uh, professionals and or you need to network to get into the extracurriculars. Exactly. hundred percent. Okay. okay. Yeah, exactly. So like there's network built into extracurriculars and coming out of it. It's not separate. Okay. Exactly. Totally. Okay. Great. Um, now I, I want to direct the next question to Yan Yan. Um, so, you know, networking, I'm sure can be very intimidating, especially with the online environment. So before we get into the actual coffee chatting, can you talk a little bit about how did you first organize your approach? So things from like, how did you find out who to network with? Um, exactly, like, uh, how did you keep track, etc? Like, how can someone who's never networked before, uh, build a little structure and organize themselves? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think like first you want to like 
uh, till this day, I still kind of get the jitters before doing a coffee chat just because like, I don't want to embarrass myself or ask dumb questions. So mostly if it's about like industry or more basic questions, I would like go Google first or try to talk to upper years to get some more information through that. And then um, generally like upper years are very open to explaining. And if the chat goes well, you can even ask for an introduction to someone in the firm. And usually uh, the people inside the firm have multiple emails per day. So uh, with an introduction, it would like generally they would respond faster and you're almost guaranteed a response uh, in general. And um, if not an introduction, just getting names in general would be good too. And you can name drop uh, the upper year inside your email and be like, oh, they recommended me to talk to you. And in general, it just helps a lot with like connection. Um, before I go into coffee chats, I would always have this master list of general questions. And these general questions it comes from like a more of an iterative process where uh, if there's a question that I've asked before that seems like it got a good feedback, I would make sure to ask that again and again in future coffee chats. Um, I think, but in general, it's just really important to tailor your questions to the person you're chatting with. And like Iman, I also love LinkedIn stalking. Um, so I would check like what clubs they were in before or like what interests they have, just whatever I can see that's in common with me on their LinkedIn and make sure to ask those type of questions to just let them know that, hey, like I'm tailoring this chat to you and like I'm putting this genuine thought into it. And I think like more specifically in the online environment, there's not much of a difference from my perspective. It's just um, understanding uh, that like people, uh, maybe it's just because of the nature of working at home where Zoom meetings pop up randomly and like meetings will go over time for them. And so your original scheduled call would be pushed back, for example. So just make sure you have a more flexible schedule and don't be like discouraged if they have to move the schedule around a bit. I, I love your advice, Yan Yan. I think um, the first one I really highlight, I want to highlight for the SPP crowd. So what Yan Yan was explaining in, in my own words would be when you start networking, don't just jump right in with the industry professionals, leverage your upper years. Um, for example, all every first year on this call, it means that they also have a mentor. And if your mentor isn't in exactly the field you want to be anymore, that's okay, guess what? SPP has additional mentors and everyone who's part of SPP shows uh, an interest to mentoring. And these are great people to start with. They are the ones that, and you should also be seeking advice like, hey, you know, like how do you think our coffee went, et cetera, do you have advice? Because it is a soft skill for you to develop. And as you get more comfortable and have great questions as Yan Yan mentioned, maybe then you're able to quote unquote level up and start to chat with those industry professionals. And then one day you'll get to the Yan Yan Iman LinkedIn stalking professional networking uh, platform. But uh, don't be nervous to start with your upper years and get comfortable with it. Um, just wanted to ask quickly, Iman, Sasha, if you guys had anything else to add to this uh, question or if uh, we want to skip to the next one. I can just add something super, super quick okay. where what I did was I just list. So I, I would go on LinkedIn and I would just have like one day where I listed like literally everyone that I was interested in talking to. Like it would be an Excel sheet with like hundreds of names. Um, and then for each person, then I would do what Yan Yan did is just see if I'm compatible with anyone, if I have anything in common, and then I would prioritize those. So then I would email them and then if they didn't respond, then I would start going down the list. Um, but yeah, that, that was a way for me to organize and like have line of sight. Cause like some companies, there's only two people. So then you really need to like be sharp and some people there's like a hundred people to network with. So it's a little less stressful. So it also helps you gauge that a little bit. That's a really great point. So staying organized, right? Like after you have a chat, doesn't go out the window. You have it. You understood who did you who did you chat within that firm? Who's left, etc. And I also want to add one thing was with that uh, with that method of kind of reaching out to multiple people at once. Um, the great thing is when you start to get response, you, you get really excited. And even if uh, maybe half the people didn't respond, you're kind of focused on the half that do. Uh, so that can also keep you motivated and positive during the pretty scary pro uh, process. Okay. 
So um, our next question is specifically, you know, uh, Iman, you mentioned uh, the biggest benefit of networking is, of course, getting that job. Um, but our, our audience here are mostly first and second year students, and they want to ask, are there any particular types of jobs that they are more eligible for and or should be targeting? Like, for example, maybe uh, consulting jobs typically don't hire first years as, a, as an analyst, a summer analyst. So is there anything that you would recommend? Uh, yeah, so I remember being in these shoes and getting really worried that I didn't have a fancy internship when I was in first year. Um, and what I kind of figured out is that nobody is really going to offer a, a, like a great internship to a first year student. And if, if your friends are getting it, I, it, personally, I feel like it's because they have connections or they have friends or family that work there. And it's like, okay, like we know why you got that internship, cool. And I think companies, when they recruit you, when you're in your third or fourth year, recognize that in your first year summer, you're not expected to have a flashy internship. So I would actually flip the problem on its head and think, you have this four months to do something and it doesn't have to be an internship. You can volunteer, you can create something. I think the advice I got from one of my mentors was why do you want to spend four months doing some like BS internship at a bank doing Excel if you can write a book instead? Like that would be such a better story to tell. So I would say there are opportunities where you can network and maybe apply for jobs, but look at it more as you have these four months. You will probably never have four months again where you can do something creative, where you can really show some personal impact. And how can you best use that time to tell a really good story in second year? Uh, when recruiting comes around. So I love that. Iman. That would be my advice for first year. Yeah. So I think if I was to rephrase it, it's that jobs and internship isn't the only thing you can do to have a meaningful summer. The point is to have a meaningful summer. Um, however way that matters to you. If, you, if you're into writing like Iman, maybe it's writing a book. Um, for example, uh, Ontario has a great program that offers uh, funding uh, to students to start a small business, which I think is a, such a valuable opportunity, like no, literally no risk opportunity if you don't exceed um, the cost that they, uh, the, of the funding they give you. Um, and it's true, you really won't get another summer. And speaking for myself, I didn't get an internship, but I worked um, as a work study student at York while I, was, uh, uh, while I did a drama a course which I really loved and I think that was enough for me because I got to do something I was really passionate about uh, at the same time I got to develop some good skills and have something to show like hey I'm doing something with my summer and I was able to build and build eventually into an internship um, and Yan Yan Sasha what did you guys do for your first year? Yeah um, actually my first year went uh, I did volunteering with Isaac one of uh, I'm sure a lot of universities yep. Have that yeah. club? Yeah. Um, so I went to Taiwan as a volunteer English teacher for two months. Um, and I think that actually really built with my story as I was trying to connect back to my culture as like, my parents are immigrants. I've never really, I was like born and raised here. So I've never really been in Asia before. So it was a great um, experience for me. And um, I guess it also really pushes um, into the rest of like the story that I pitched to people afterwards as well. Um, actually, I came back after those two months and did a really short-term um, marketing internship at a startup. And so I think first year is such a flexible year for you to do just whatever that interests you first. And like, as long as the story can wrap itself up, I think you can do anything that you are passionate about in your first year, especially. So Yan Yan, can we get a little bit more concrete? I think Iman also mentioned the idea of a story, something that builds to your story. What does that really mean? Um, wow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, you can think about it. We can come back if you'd like. Um, it's, it's quite a loaded question, so I would pass it to someone else. <laughs> okay, maybe, yeah. maybe Sasha, if you would like to take this. If not, I can take it myself. Sorry, Yan Yan. <laughs> No, I'll take, I'll take it. So um, yeah, I think my advice is very similar. So uh, what I did was um, I was actually, so before my, up until my first year summer, I was basically uh, working at like at, as a deli clerk at like Partino's, uh, which was like an all-time great job. Um, obviously not for vegetarians, but for me it was. Um, then in my summer, I got a job at TD as like a bank teller. So like it wasn't, wasn't anything special. Um, 
So I didn't even look for an internship in first year. I was actually looking for a job just because I needed the money. So like I worked part time during the year and then uh, during the summer I worked full time. Um, and then I ended up getting an internship in second year, which we can talk about. I think the point about the story is I knew I wanted to get into investment banking, like even in year one. Um, so my goal was just get anything finance related, right? And then you can build that story. So for example, even if you're a bank teller at TD, right? You can still say, hey, you know, like I'm a first year, didn't have many opportunities, but here's one opportunity that I knew I could potentially get um, related to finance. And then you can start talking about like, oh, you know, this is what I learned from the financial services by talking to like clients, right? Like this is how they thought about their money. This is how like wealth management plays a role in retail and so on and so forth, right? Um, so that's how you can like sort of build that story. So like, for example, if you're interested in like fashion or whatever the case may be, you can just work retail at like Zara or something, right? And that's like a good, great experience because you're talking to the, the clients and you know exactly, um, you know, what they want. Um, and so you become an expert basically on like what the customer wants. And I think the other thing is um, just like echoing what Iman said, it's, it's like literally risk-free because no one really expects you to get anything first year. Um, so it's like the only time in your life where you actually have no risk. Obviously there's risk in terms of like monetary risk. Like for me, I needed money. So I needed to do something paid. Um, but if that's not an issue, you literally have no risk. Um, cause no one expects you to do anything. Um, so if you do anything, it's great. And then also during that time, you can just do whatever you want. And if it succeeds, it's great. So like you can even do like a YouTube channel. I've heard people like do spot, like a, uh, like a podcast, um, during the first year and they had like a hundred people like they didn't have like a hundred subscribers they had like a hundred viewers during the whole summer and they put this on the resume and they they ended up getting like a banking job with me in third year so like i think um do whatever you want the I'll, I'll just sort of be an advocate for a paid job the one benefit though is that if you do a paid job versus those other sort of activities there's a level of respect that recruiters will give you in terms of okay well this person knows how to show up to work on time. This person knows what it means to work for a paycheck, to be responsible for a task, stuff like that. So there is benefit and there's ways um, to separate yourself if you do have a paid job. Um, but at the end of the day, I wouldn't worry about it too much. And I would more focus on like, what is the end goal? Like, where do you see yourself? Um, and then try to m do something that at all relates. That's, I guess, my advice. That's great. So if I was to sum up everyone's responses, one, you will not die if you don't get an internship in first year. In fact, it's more rare. <laughs> um, and two, uh, whatever you do with that time, it has to work for this thing called a story. And if I was to also boil that down, um, it can come in two ways. One is uh, based off of what your overall end goal is, think about the industry and think about the soft skills. Can you demonstrate that any sort of way in your summer, whether that's, for example, as Sasha did, found a job in the industry, I'm um, not necessarily doing banking, but he's in the industry or yeah, yeah, she was teaching. But guess what? She's she's showing communication skills. Everyone on the SVP team, they're showing problem solving every time they can make an event great or something new. And I think that's what you have to think about. Right. And that's what what your resume is for, right? Like if you think about it, like it boils down into those skills and you can build those skills in paid, unpaid, volunteer, or even entrepreneurial activities. Um, so don't, uh, and if you do choose to have a relaxing summer, um, that is okay, but do recognize that someone who puts effort into it, um, they will get rewarded um, and you can, but it does sound as though it's recoverable and maybe gets a little bit more important as the years go on. Okay. So moving on to our next question. So we talked a bit about why is it important and how can we start setting up? Let's say you're in the coffee chat now, you're chatting with someone. How do you actually know if you're like, well, one, how did you personally distinguish yourself? Like, Yanyan, you mentioned some things like uh, some critical things like uh, finding some personal connections, but how did you distinguish yourself? Uh, and then the second part of that question is how did you know if you were doing a good job? Uh, maybe we can start with uh, Iman. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting question because I, I find that on my coffee chats, I try and make it more about them than me. So I suppose I give them enough context so that they kind of know where I'm coming from. So I might reference the school that I'm from. If I'm, you know, in second year, I'll say that. Or if I've, if I've had one year of work experience, I'll mention that. Um, but really, I'll focus more on, on why I'm so excited to speak with them 
and you know what I'm hoping to learn from their experience on that call. Often what happens is they might ask for more information. Like they might be, they might say like, oh, so like, where are you at? Like in your career journey or, you know, why are you choosing to explore this industry? And then I think that conversation goes a little bit better when it's invited versus me just speaking for a minute on who I am. Cause um, it's their time that I should be grateful for and, and not the other way around. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Iman. I think there's a, a saying, whether or not it's formalized or not, but it's that people love talking about themselves. <laughs> so I think, Iman, you use that to your advantage and get uh, focus the conversation on them. Uh, and I think uh, the second thing is, is that probably you're asking great questions to get them to talk about themselves. It's not just a random question like, like uh, you know, what color is your shoe? How did you choose that? You know, you had some, I imagine you had some thoughtful questions and they're like, hey, this is a great question. And I love to talk about it. So, um, so I, and I love that idea. So it's not necessary. Standing out doesn't mean um, speaking for most of the chat by any means. Um, uh, Sasha, did you have a different perspective or anything else to add? Uh, how do you determine if you're having a, a great chat? Yeah, so also one thing you guys can take notes of is like the way that Carol's like managing the conversation is quite good for coffees as well. Like when you get a response, uh, sort of like talk about it a little bit, relate to it, and then like follow up, not to put like Carol on the spot based on what she's doing, but like that's that's also kind of how coffee goes naturally um, or like a good coffee, in my opinion. Um, I think, so how I think I try to make a good coffee, very similar to Amon, like you want them to talk uh, a lot. Uh, but I think the one thing for me is like, you want to make sure you're, you are yourself. Like one of the main things uh, in networking is like, try to assume that you're going to get every single offer. Um, right. And so if you want the best offer, you also want to be yourself. Um, and so if you are yourself and you get the offer and you like the people, then that might be the great job for you. But if you're pretending to be someone you're not, you might get all the offers, but then actually not realize which one you should pick. Uh, because like, you weren't your, your real self, right? So you don't really know if you like the people there or not because you were just a persona. Um, I know for me, I did that exact thing, like where I was, I was like portraying myself as this like, oh, I'm this like investment banking guy. Um, and like, I was very successful in like getting multiple offers. But at the same time, once I got those offers, um, I had no idea what to pick um, because like, I literally, I just didn't know, like, like I didn't know how they related to me. I just knew how they related to like this guy that I like created. Um, and then in terms of like how I know a coffee went well is like for me, literally uh, it's the same thing for interviews as it is for like coffees. If they laugh, you succeeded. Um, Cause I think, honestly, I think that's what it comes down to. If like you can go and like hit them with like one joke that lands, like I think you're pretty good. Um, just my honest opinion. But I think that like, that's how I measure is like the number of laughs I get is like how well I think I did. Um, <laughs> And Last historically, yeah, and I, I think historically, based on like my uh, like successes and failures, that's like been a pretty good, uh, pretty like if you built a regression, it would be pretty good. Okay, so um, and and I love the points you made, Sasha. So um, I, I also want to like echo a couple. I think one of the things that can distinguish uh, an early networker versus a more seasoned networker is if uh, when I'm chatting with a student, if I feel like they're reading through a list of questions or if they're having a conversation with me, right? So if you feel as though uh, you're always kind of referring back to your list, that might most likely not feel as organic versus if we talk about something and hey, a new idea came up. For example, when chatting with, uh, pre in the previous question, I wasn't thinking of asking about a story, but stories kept coming up. So I naturally went into that rep, like what is a story? And that really shows like, hey, one, you're very, very engaged in the conversation. And two, uh, you're not just copy and pasting all of your questions of the past chat. This is our conversation and it's memorable. And I also want to echo a, a, another point Sasha made, I think it's really important about being yourself because it's not, uh, because unfortunately, uh, uh, there are some people that they have a dream job, they, they build themselves up to be exactly that, and then they successfully get in, and then they don't like the job. And it's really unfortunate uh, because they work so hard and I understand, and it's all the reasons they loved it is true, but there were maybe some reasons that they didn't like about it, that they were pushing at the back of their mind, that if they were more honest about, they could have actually ended up finding a better opportunity for themselves. So it's really reflecting on yourself, like, why do you actually want this, right? And sometimes when you end a coffee chat and it turns out not to be right, sometimes I've chatted with students and I'm like, hey, I actually don't think consulting's for you, but I don't think it's a bad chat sometimes because like we asked some deep questions and we got to some uh, 
important things about um, the personality of a consultant and the personality of you, and you're able to check check the box off, hey, this path isn't for me, I'm very happy to move on. So uh, that's just uh, my perspective as well. I just want to ask Yang Yan, uh, well, I already told everyone that I thought you were one of my favorite Coffee Chat students. I want to ask you, you know, how did you assess that? Did you feel yourself that uh, we were having good chats, like uh, any barometers to use? Yeah, so, I mean, I think for like, uh, in general, um, coffee chats how to distinguish yourself is just there's a fine balance between being prepared and being flexible um prepared like you have a bunch of questions going in but flexible is like when like you go into your coffee chat within the first few minutes of chatting you kind of get the overall feeling of what the other person is like um if they're more serious or if they like to talk a lot or if they love some jokes um if they're more serious then like Sorry, Sasha, I would not crack jokes. <laughs> they would, um, I remember doing that once and it didn't turn out well for me. So um, I think like you just have to be flexible in some ways of like picking whichever, uh, uh, picking whichever question you want to ask. And then you also want to be engaging. Like Carol said, you want to ask follow-up questions. You also want to like smile and not to just show that you're engaged with the conversation. And for Carol, um, our conversation, I think a lot of it came from, um, I think just me coming up with questions on the spot really to like tailor to our like conversation flow and also um, taking notes. I think that's really important to remember what the other person said before. And then when you're doing your catch up calls or even when you're doing your follow up emails, um, mention some of the highlights that you guys talked about through the conversation and then or maybe like a few months after when you're doing the catch-up call you can be like oh I took from our conversation last time this is what I improved on because of your advice I think that was um kind of one of the things that I, I remember Carol like being like wow you remembered so I think it, it's like one of the few things that you can distinguish yourself with and kind of would put a bit more of a lasting impression that great points, Yan Yan. Uh, especially the part of, point about taking notes. Um, I know, I know, I don't. I think most people they either think they have a great memory, um, or maybe you acknowledge you don't have a great memory. But sometimes uh, taking notes can save your life, uh, and this is a skill like throughout. I know maybe now we have online lectures. I imagine you can probably replay them. You can't necessarily do that with coffee chats, and it doesn't look great to re-ask the same questions you've already asked. So taking notes is a, a, a great way. Like one, it's it's looked upon well, and two, you never know. Like sometimes you flip back and there's something that they said previously that you didn't find as important, and now you're seeing some importance in it. So you may want to go back to. So, and I love that, Yan Yan. And I think that takes us very well into our next question, which is about, you know, you mentioned Yan Yan follow-up uh, conversation. This means that you been able to maintain a relationship it wasn't a one coffee and done situation uh, it seemed as more uh, you were developing relationships so what I want to ask uh, each of the speaker uh, on their own time is one how many of your coffee chats led to long-term relationships I probably not 100% so you know, just a ballpark was it most of them less than half just only a handful select few you know how many actually led to long-term relationships and then two how did you go about like fostering and maintaining that long-term relationship. So I know, yeah, and you were just talking about it, so maybe I can throw it back to you. Yeah, awesome. Um, so really sad to say, it's only a handful that I've kept um, long-term relationships for. I think this really stems from, um, especially during recruiting period, uh, you talk to like multiple people from one firm. There's just so many people to talk to, you would end up losing track of them. And also, um, only some conversations will last will give you such a lasting impression that you're like damn i really want to continue like keeping this relationship with this person and kind of how i developed is just like uh either holidays i would email and then or maybe like after a few months especially uh to give a follow-up email and just be like hey this is how what's happening with me um or maybe like oh can we do a catch-up call i think few months is good to because you want to build some things to talk about. Um, you just don't want to go into co coffee chat to catch up and have nothing to talk about. Um, I think um, it's also really helpful to just 
send like a thank you note afterwards. Uh, and like, even if you don't want to catch up in general, you just still want to send an email to just remind them like, hey, I still ex exist um, and I still want to build the relationship with you. So uh, yeah, those are just my few points. Okay, so you, you, you leverage both uh, general emails, doesn't always have to be a full chat, and then uh, for select individuals, uh, when you did want to chat again, it was definitely um, sounded at least at least months apart, but I, what I took away was that make sure that something happened between that time, and maybe you can reference those valuable notes to say, what did you talk about? Did you make any advancements in that area? Maybe that will lead to a great conversation following up. Um, that's great. Uh, Iman, fellow LinkedIn stalker, uh, how, how did you maintain uh, any of your relationships and approximately, you know, how, how many did you end up maintaining? I feel a little embarrassed that my nickname is now LinkedIn stalker, but I will take it. I'm going to embrace it. Um, I would, it's hard to approximate, I think maybe like 60, 70 percent. Um, and I'd say it's a fairly deliberate effort. You know, I think the way to look at your coffee chats is that they are the opposite of transactional. They are the opposite of one chat. If anything, that first chat you're having, whether it's a prearranged coffee chat or networking in the halls of Schulich at an event, you're opening up the lines of communication for an entire relationship to form over years. Because if you meet someone in first year and you keep up that relationship, then in third year where you might need to cash in that credit, so to speak, you've got like two or three years of a solid relationship there. So some of the tactical things that have helped me, uh, one are cards. So I'm a big um, card writer. Every Christmas, I probably send out maybe up to like 50 Christmas cards handwritten wow. to a bunch of my mentors, people who have helped me. Some people have only had like one chat with me. If I don't have their address, I send it to their company's offices. Of course, this was possible during COVID when everyone was in the office. Um, because mentors like to know how their advice has helped you. So I feel like for them, like if you just have the chat and then leave them in the dark, they're kind of like, oh, like I wonder what that person is doing now. So you can give them that satisfaction of seeing your progress. So I definitely do that. And then there's other touch points like birthdays and promotions that you can also use to keep in touch and just keep that connection alive. Um, and I think that really helps with the relationship building. Iman, I love your point about it definitely not being one-sided or transactional. Uh, I think it sometimes appears that way, right? Like, oh, maybe you're a small student talking to a big professional uh, person, but really when it, when it boils down, uh, you could actually form a great relationship. I can say personally, some of my uh, relationships that started off as a coffee, it actually turned into genuine friendship. Uh, I'm not saying all of your coffees will be friendships. <laughs> uh, you probably also don't want them all to be friendship. That's a lot of friends to maintain. <laughs> um, but the point is that uh, it really is um, a, a two-way uh, relationship. And that's the most important thing. If, if it's going to be long-term, it's relationship. It's not just uh, you want to get something out of them one time and it's, and it's kind of done. And uh, one more thing I want to add uh, to what Iman said was all, a lot of a, a few students who I coffeeed with that ended up actually at my firm. It was really great for them to accelerate now the next round of networking required because uh, at least in consulting, you never stop networking. Uh, once you get into the firm, you need to network for your project. So the students who I had met previously on the first day, they were able to email me saying, hey, I started, let's chat. And, and I was able to get their networks going as well. So and it just goes to show that it's not just when you're a student at one time. Uh, Sasha, any uh, last words on the point about maintaining long-term relationships and how many did you end up maintaining? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I met a lot of people when I was going through the process, probably like, I don't know, 300 or so uh, throughout like my time at university. Um, I've probably like kept in like solid, like when I say, when I mean long term, I mean like multiple years, um, probably like only like 10 or so. Um, so I guess like, so, and it goes back to like what I said before, because I was, I was thinking about it very much as like getting a job. Uh, it wasn't as genuine most of the time. Actually, it's funny because like I did most of my networking with people in investment banking, but the long term ones, almost none of them are in investment banking. And I afterwards I realized I was like, holy shit, I don't actually <laughs> I don't actually care about investment banking at all. <laughs> but anyways, anyways, regardless, um, I think that's that's one thing. Um, and then the other thing, just like one quick note is in terms of following up, uh, I think like holidays and stuff are great. Um, 
but like I've already established my memory sucks. So like, I'm usually like, I'm that guy, like it's like December 15th. I'm like, all right, 10 days. I'm gonna send all those emails. I'm gonna follow up with everyone. And then like, it's like December 30th. And I'm like, ah, shit, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't message anyone. So I think it's okay. like, I don't, wouldn't worry. Like, it doesn't mean it's too late. Like, feel free to shoot them the message like afterwards and just say like, hey, hope your holidays were fine or whatever. It's like super okay. Um, that's like one thing. And then the second thing is I wouldn't follow up. Uh, this is just me personally, but like, you can always follow up, but I wouldn't follow up unless you have, like Yanya mentioned, something to talk about. So for example, if like, you had an interview or something, let them know and then offer like, like ask them for a coffee chat or something like that. Um, even if it's like, like, so if it's been two months or something, for example, right. And you have this like number in your head, like don't, there's no need to follow up if there's nothing to like, if there's nothing new to talk about, it's okay. If it takes a little bit longer, like four or five months or whatever the case may be. Um, but yeah, anyways, that's just, okay. No, I, I think that's really great. So I think there's like a, a wide array of, um, you know, amounts of relationship uh, that you maintain long term. But I think one thing that all of our speakers said is that all of those relationships are very intentional. Um, you know, they make a point to keep following up and to make all those follow up sessions uh, meaningful. I see we have a couple questions in the chat. Let me just. Uh... Yeah, we do. We have two questions. Okay. Uh, we can start with uh, the first one, unless Serene, you had another one you want to pull out. Uh, no, uh, I'll, I'll start off with the first one. Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll give it to our, our speakers. So the question is from Harsh, and it says, because of COVID, I think a lot of first and second year students are growing up with the virtual coffee chat slash phone call. So my question is, what is the transition going to be like to be an, in an in-person chat, and how can we prepare for it? Maybe we can throw that one to Iman, because I think, Iman, you, you've done a fair mix of online and in-person. Is there anything major to change? I mean, I think a lot of us hope that this is this is going to be done soon, like we'll be out of the pandemic, so hopefully it won't always be the reality. Um, I'd say try and make it feel as real as possible. You know, the people you're talking to are more than just voices on the other end of a phone call. Um, so certainly if you can, I would actually do it like a video call instead of a phone call, because that creates a little bit more of a personable atmosphere. And, and one of the things I actually did earlier this year, because I'm trying to find more professionals in my particular field of marketing, is even though we're not meeting up for a real coffee, I send them a gift card afterwards for a coffee. And I'm like, go buy yourself a drink on me, because I appreciate your time. And if I was meeting up with you in person, this would definitely be on me. So like, you can still choose to use some of those tactics that kind of set the right tone so that once the pandemic is over, you know, you can reach out to them again and be like, hey, like, would be great to finally meet up in person this time. And I'm sure they'd be open to it. Those are great tips, Iman. And, and I actually have to like personally weighing in. I, I honestly don't think there was a huge difference of online versus in person. If it was in person, we simply schedule a day strictly on Fridays when I'm in the office. And uh, if it's virtual now, I can do other days of the week as well. So I honestly think the interaction is much different. Uh, maybe you have to practice a handshake, <laughs> but that's about it. Honestly, I, I wouldn't say it is anything big. Um, I know we only have a few minutes left. So um, for the folks that did ask additional questions, would love for you to bring this into the, our networking session uh, next. But I did want to be able to wrap up um, our session properly by asking our panelists, uh, you know, uh, now that we've gone through most of our question, is there any other pieces of advice you think weren't covered and or myths that you want to um, bust? Uh, anything else you want to mention to our students prior to moving to our networking session? Maybe, Sasha, we can start with you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just follow up on that last question, and that also ties into my last thing, is like, uh, and this is something I struggle with, and maybe you guys have noticed, is like, your your face, like, it, like it matters what it looks like. Um, so, like, sometimes, you know, like, resting bitch face, or like, like, you don't think about what your face looks like. So like some, so like in, I, so like for example, I did a lot of phone chats as well as like in person when I was going through the process. Um, so on phone, like you don't need to like your face could look like anything, right? But like when you're when someone's like looking at your face, it's important to like you know breathe, smile a bit, you know, uh, like because like if you're just like dead staring them in the face, like it gets a little intimidating. It's like bro, I don't know, this this might not be the right thing for you, like. So anyways, I think it's just important, like, what your face looks like and make sure, like, you think, like, don't, don't spend the whole time thinking about it, but it's just, like, every, like, five or ten minutes, just, like, think about, like, are my muscles stiff? Like, maybe I'm just, like, making one face the whole time. 
Uh, so just like, just put a like small amount of thought into it. It goes a long way. So. Okay. So it sounds like Sasha's uh, recommending Botox for constant smiles. <laughs> and that way you don't have the stiff face, but you're always friendly. Um, Yan Yan, uh, any other tips on your perspective, especially if you have anything uh, more relevant to the, the COVID area? Yeah. Um, I mean, I echo what everyone just said. I think in general, um, I'm like, personal experience, like to this day, sometimes I'd still get like coffee chats that aren't the best. And I think like those really shouldn't like bring you down, even though you have one bad coffee chat, it's like a one-off thing. And you've got to understand that sometimes it just doesn't work out. You just don't click and you can't really please everyone. And as Sasha said, like, it's really important to like show off your personality and just like, uh, but just to say, like, it doesn't mean you should go around and make enemies, but <laughs> just don't be too discouraged and kind of take it as a learning opportunity um, and improving your next chat. I love that, Yan Yan. It really is, um, one, it's a soft skill, and so you can improve. And two, uh, just like you might not love every person you coffee with, it's okay if you don't feel uh, that every coffee chat was your best either. Uh, I'm sure you did, a, like, a good enough job, um, as long as you don't straight up insult them. Uh, should most likely be okay and uh, you'll focus on the ones that uh, are most positive. And Iman, to end it off, any final advice from you? Yeah, I think the biggest struggle I had, like especially in first and second year, was feeling like I had nothing to offer the people who I was networking with because they have the experience. I'm the one who's fresh, fresh in school, not even fresh out of school. So how do I show them that this is going to be valuable for them? And maybe looking back, the advice I have is, you can show that through gratitude. You can show that by having really great empathy by how you set up the coffee chat and making it easy for them to be of most value for you. And, and what I mean by that is when you're setting up your coffee chat, just think about what the experience is going to be for the person on the receiving end. Are you sending a really long email that they have to go through? Have you proposed times for your coffee chat so they can just select when they want it? Have you sent a calendar invite? And most importantly, are you making them feel good on that call for sharing their expertise and their lessons learned? And then following up with a very genuine thank you note showing how their time was valuable because they spent it with you. So I think that is really the value you can offer even if you're in first and second year. And um, you know, it should help when you're, you're having those chats. I completely agree with you, Iman. I, I get so happy when I hear a student I spoke to, uh, if it sounds as though one thing I said helped them, and that's enough for me to, to feel as though it was worth it for me on that coffee chat too. So completely agreed there, Iman. Um, so thank you so much to our speakers for our advice today. Um, Iman and Sasha will be at our uh, uh, networking breakout room, so you guys can have a chance to catch them there. Uh, before I turn it back to SPP, I just want to quickly throw it to Zareen to see if you had any final words from an international student perspective, uh, final advice you want to give before we move into the networking session. I guess the only thing I would mention is, I don't know if there are any international students here, but I know um, if you're halfway across the world and not currently in Canada, that is extremely challenging because there's many different factors, like you know the time difference, you don't know anybody in a completely new country that you're about to embark in, on a new journey on. So I think some of the top tips I would say is, you know, just, just because of that limitation, don't hesitate to like reach out to upper years digitally. Everything is digital right now. So that shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't think of that as a hindrance in your path. So definitely reach out, you know, make sure you have LinkedIn. That's extremely crucial. Even if you're in first year, I think that's the first thing that you should be doing and leveraging social media to kind of reach out to people. And, you know, once you get here, make sure you follow up on those connections and actually meet in person, right? Because you're going to be like, okay, right now I can't really meet you. Obviously COVID and all, I'm not in the country, but once you come here you can actually take the time and follow up and you know develop that relationship I think that's extremely important and you know with the note in terms of like you know what to do in first year because again you can't come into the country perhaps just yet uh, still do something within your own country make sure that you show that you know within COVID you weren't just sitting around you were doing something that was actually fruitful with your time I think that will definitely add value uh, going forward when, when you're going to be actually here and you know networking and going about your journey in terms of getting a job internship whatever it is so I would just like to echo everything that everyone said I think that was really fantastic and you know just because you're an international student I think that's all the more reasons for you to really differentiate yourself from everybody else and take those opportunities uh, as they come.